just like old times three people in a podcast. Yep. Back in the range. Two are right. safely snug in their homes and one is in a tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be a little bit interesting, so. There can be only one. They're here. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello, welcome to Cinema Royale, where we explode it geekum, geekdom when it comes to cinema. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape, and we're kind of a little shorthand here with co-host today. I'll kind of explain briefly. Jada is a little pooped out after going to see to a Broadway show called Once. Uh, Matt Brunet, also known as Animat, uh, had a week-end-long bachelor party, which should be interesting enough to figure out what happened. And that's it. As long as a donkey's not involved, I think he'll be okay. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So we'll see those two back in a couple of weeks. So it's just be the three of us tonight. Uh, classic old-school, you know, podcast format. Uh, so let me introduce to you my co-host of Cinema Epicness. Epicness. I'm, I'm fumbling with word stain. What the fuck's going on with me? I'm just so... Too much sugar on me. I was, I was making waffles today, goddammit. I was so excited. I'm such you're a nerd. So, you're so excited, your webcam turned off. Damn Skype! Hello, hello, hello. Are you out of the tunnel yet? Yes, we are. <laughs> Sorry, was I just introduced and missed no, it? No, no, I didn't do nothing. No. no. God damn it. <laughs> the giggles. I'm so joy. Uh, wow. First up. God damn. I can't do this. It's so fun. Mike. Mike, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> we're, we're here. We are here for you. I know, I'm just... I got the giggles, I can't stop laughing. For those of you listening, I am I am indeed here, and I'm recording live from the back of a of an SUV. <laughs> alright, so I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna go roll with this, alright? So, let me introduce you to my co-host. First up, we got Morgan Ledger, whose appearance is the 20th... 20th episode. 20 episodes, baby. Yay. To be honest, in dog years, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> and as you heard, you could hear him. It's James Sullivan, also known as Jaime Tootie's live from back of a car. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by waking up to find cat piss all over your backpack. Oh! <laughs> James, 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 let me ask. Were the sandwiches safe? <laughs> Uh, yes. Good. Yes, but yes, but my laptop bag needs washing. Oh. Ooh. Oh, that's brutal. That is brutal. Yeah, there, there was some. Yeah, that I went to a party last night. It was somebody's birthday. There's a, a speculation over whether or not it's cat pee or somebody spilled their beer on it. But, um, but yeah, I, uh, you'll be glad, you'll be glad to know that for a while I was actually pretty lit last night, but brought myself back down again with some delicious burritos. So. <laughs> I find it funny that that's like the biggest cure. Burritos. Oh man, I gotta get out of this. Oh, burritos, my last ditch effort. <laughs> Oh, quick! Get the hot sauce. It's the only way to get me out of this funk. <laughs> she, you, you should have seen the birthday girl though. She was on the floor, man. She was <laughs> just passed out, drunk. They still do that? Oh, are you kidding me, Morgan? You don't know they, half of it. <laughs> we we live in a world where we still have stripper firemen. <laughs> Anyways, anyways, the stupid, stupid podcast. 
It's okay, Mike. It's okay. We can get through this. I'm gonna chug through this. I'm fine. I was kind of skeptical about Jay's being back in the car, but I'll 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 fly with it. I'll it see. It looks like he's probably another wind tunnel from as we speak of it. Oh god, what the fuck now? Yo. Yo. Yo yo. Night. <laughs> it's one of those nights. I'm so glad I did my research. I'm so glad you did too, because we're gonna have fun talking about them whenever we get to it. <laughs> I needed this so bad. Uh, oh man. Uh, I'm just gonna research extra films to see if I missed anything. <laughs> Like what? <laughs> what other films? Well, for starters, the last movie I saw him in was The Swing Vote, and that was just not good. Mm. Though, to be fair, he reunited with Kevin Costner, so... Yeah, yeah that was kind of a cool little fact. Yeah. Where did I put that one? Oh, it's right here in the stack of my DVDs. Come on. My only connection between two episodes is uh, true romance here, because Dennis Hopper plays like a s smallish lead in here as the father of Christian Slater's character. But Christopher Walken's in this film, so it's like, oh hey, Dennis Hopper and Christopher Walken was in a film. Brilliant. A segue to the next episode. <laughs> oh my god. That's a long wind tunnel, holy crap. I'll say. <laughs> like, that's a tunnel, I mean, it's a long-ass tunnel. Wait, do I have to add him in? Maybe I should add him in, I don't know. Ah, okay, here we go, one more time. <laughs> I swear. I felt so bad for the cat piss. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Ah, did I fudge everything up? No, 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 this is going to be a fun podcast, James. Don't you worry, James, you're just, just fine, just fine. Just keep sitting behind that car, you know, just sitting in there, just relax, <laughs> listen to our voices. Okay. I'm just going, I'm going mad, okay? I'm going mad right now, so I can chuck through this. You know, in hindsight, I should have watched my science project prior to this podcast because he's in that movie. Oh my god, he is? Well, we don't... Well, we still have time. After this podcast, we'll be right back. Uh... Hey. Well, guess what, guys? We're home. Oh, cool. They're here. Yeah, it'll be good. <laughs> Skype, is that you? I'll, uh... I'll, I'll call you guys back in a moment here. Hang on. Do that, I'll wait. Alright. Okay. I got nothing. Got mine! Oh, spotlight fetish. <laughs> Steven Spielberg's directing this. Mm hmm. Okay. So, for this episode. <laughs> I can't do it with a straight face. I can't do it with a straight face. <laughs> As you can see by the title of the, of the episode, and if you know from last time, we're going to talk about Dennis Hopper uh, for this episode, because today is his birthday. Uh, he would have been... Fuck, what was it? Like... 
I didn't do my research, so I wouldn't even know how old he would have been. But we're also kind of paying homage to him because he died five years ago next week. So we're kind of paying homage to him with his films. And mm -hmm. uh, we got three films worth talking about. Maybe additional tidbits here and there. I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens in this podcast. Uh, yeah, James <laughs> James is like pretty chill back of the car. Yeah, so we're just just gonna be fine. It's gonna be fine. It's gonna be fine. Mhm. Mm I got my secret seized candy stash back here somewhere. I can one up on that one. Oh, you'll be salty, but cheesy. Okay. So, so, Dennis Hopper is a decorated, a, a award-claiming director and actor in the business. He's been in tons upon tons of films throughout his career, and, um... I believe, I believe if I'm correct, James has one of the earliest films he's ever starred and directed in, if I'm correct. Well, I was, uh, I was gonna go with that. But, but... You cha you're gonna change it up for me, aren't you? What, what's your film for tonight, buddy? Okay. I, for the record, I was gonna go with Easy Rider, his... His big movie, which uh, uh, which made him both famous actor, director, and everything. And the reason why I was going to go for that is because I believe it's just really overrated. All right. I mean, I, mean, uh, I, I um, don't get me wrong, I like like Dennis Hopper's other work, it's just, you know, this this movie about a couple of guys just sort of uh, cowtown around around uh, the country on motorcycles. It it didn't seem to have much of a, a plot nor a purpose to it. I mean, events just sort of come in, uh, come in and go, and then at the end of the movie... At the end of the movie, uh, they all just sort of die, and well, uh, it seems just alert. so random. Spoiler yeah. alert! I mean, but for its credit, Easy Rider started this whole genre of films, starting you know the the motorcycle film, where there's all bike the biker film. That's that's the genre, biker films, where there's mm -hmm. all bikers, and that's what it started. Which I I give them credit too, because biker films are like the best things to watch. But Easy Rider, I can understand what you mean, James. I mean, Easy Rider is... It's something different. I mean, it was a, it was the late 60s, you know? It was during that era of, like, motorcycles and hippies and all that shit. Yeah, I... I like Jack... I like Jack Nicholson's character. And, uh... Then... And, uh... Yeah, Jack Nicholson plays, uh... The exact opposite of what he's typically known for. He's a uh, he's an all-American good guy here. You know the the image of a of a of a, a typical American citizen who wants to be like these guys who are uh, who are bikers and whatnot. But then guess what? Something happens to him. And and then as soon as that happens, he's forgotten. As soon as he, it, he's forgotten. Like he never was in the movie to begin with. So, right. It it it's all it this everything that happens in this movie just sort of seems pointless. Like they don't care about anything. So okay, getting along to what you finally chose to talk about in this podcast. What film did you choose, James? I chose a movie called Top of the World. Oh! <laughs> of course. Of course, the film I mentioned that's on Netflix. Mm -hmm. The one film I was considering to do... I want to 
twist. What a twist indeed. So, yeah, I, I was gonna, like, I, I saw it top, top of the world on Netflix. I was like, okay, it's a Dennis Hopper film. I'll check it out. But I was like, later, I was like, you know, I'm gonna change my movie. So, I, have, I haven't seen it, but you know what? We got James here to tell us all about it. Well, let's see. Top of the world. How shall I, how shall I put this? It's a, it's an action film with a, with a, what I call a, a 90s star cast. A lot of names that you would recognize here, like Peter Weller as the lead, uh, also known as Robocop, and uh, Dennis Hopper being the type of character that he played in the 90s, which is, well, big surprise, the bad guy. Oh, wait, before you go on, we have all chose 90s films, and all of them of which are villain roles. Mm-hmm. So this episode's gonna be all about his 90s villain era. Yeah, he was... It, well, what can I say? He was good at, uh, he was good at playing the villain. So yeah, there you go, people. If you you're gonna hear something interesting about Dennis Hopper through this era of film, so please go on. Top of the world, James. And the rest of the cast, you have uh, Tia Carrere from Wayne's World, and uh, uh, the rest of the cast. It's not really known actor per se, but um, very familiar faces. Joe Pantaliano. Uh, the guy, yeah, the guy that, um, the guy that was the, the guy that was the, um, uh, the wicked, uh, sensei from the Karate Kid movies, he's in here too. Oh, him? Pat Morticia. And who? Pat Mortica, Pat Morticia. Pat, Pat Morita? Yes. No. No, 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 no. not Mr. Miyagi. Not, no, Morgan, Morgan, bad Morgan. That's the wrong... Oh, I, I heard someone from the Karate Kid, and I was like, oh, oh is, is it that guy? No, I said the bad sensei. The bad sensei actually got in a, the DVD collection, so... Oh, I don't, I, don't even, I don't even remember the bad sensei, so it's alright. Oh, he's the best part of the films, come on. I met the actor. <laughs> Anyways, the casting sounds great. So what what's the plot of the movie? The plot of the film is Peter Weller is an ex-cop who turned ex-con uh, because he got a he got a bit of a addiction to money, shall we say? And uh, so today he's getting out of jail. So what's he gonna do? He's gonna go. He's gonna drive through La Las Vegas with his wife, uh, Tia Carrere. Okay. And uh, they're gonna and they're gonna go ahead and uh, see if they can actually get a divorce now because, uh, as it turns out, she's not. Uh, She's not too interested in seeing him anymore. She's been seeing Dennis Hopper. Oh. And Dennis Hopper is the guy who owns the Top of the World Casino. Well, it's called Cowboy Country Casino. Mm hmm? And they refer to it also as the Top of the World in, in the film. It's confusing. It is. But yeah, Dennis yeah. Harper plays a character named Charles Atlas. Yes. And uh, so while at the beginning of the film, two thi two important things happen. One, uh, Peter Weller wins at the slots. He hits the jackpot. But he's not able to, chip to pick out his chips yet because two... There's a robbery going on. Mm-hmm. Big surprise. Oh, wow. An action movie with a robbery. 
And uh, my goodness, from this point on, it's a 90s movie that that uh, that has forgotten that the 80s are over. <laughs> really? Because it is, it, it's, it's a 90s movie that, it's a 90s action film trying to be an 80s action film. Huh. Huh. Mm-hmm. Kind of dig that. There's, there's uh, one-liners, cheesy dialogue, cheesy, Ugh. uh, uh, cheesy, uh, cheesy lines from, uh, from, from thugs and whatnot. Uh, the guy, uh, there's one part where, where the, um, the, the thugs who are, who are robbing the place, they actually, they actually pose as, as launderers, you know, laundromat workers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, get it? Because they're laundering money. <laughs> All right, Chewy, not now. Shut up. And uh, they, and so they're, they're pushing, uh, they're pushing the, the uh, the the bed material through on a on a, on some sort of dolly uh, through the hotel section of the casino and uh, they're like yeah we're the we're the laundry guys uh, this guy's uh, fluffing the pillows over here and this guy he uh, uh, he's the one who puts on the blankets and then someone, and then someone actually catches up with them. They're onto their game. And they say freeze. They pull out a gun. Wait, you know, one of the other cops. And then they, the the uh, the the goons throw off the the sheets off their off their dolly. There's a bunch of guns underneath. They pick out the guns and they say fluff this. <laughs> That's the actual line? That's the line, is fluff this. Wait, so... I think I understand where Fluff My Garfield came from on whose line. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, I also forgot another big name that, that shows up in this movie. Peter Coyote. E.T. I guess so. Was he in that? Mm. Let me check. Hey, do your research. You're the fact checker, Morgan. Um, yeah. Otherwise known, you might remember as him as Big Boy from, uh, uh, from Dick Tracy. Oh, okay. I knew it! He was Keys! He was the adult in E.T., the one that had the keys on his waist there. Okay, there you yeah. go. I know my goddamn facts. There you another, go. another connection to the 80s there. There you go. Elliot, I've been waiting for this for a long time. It's a miracle to see him here. So... But, he, but here's another weird thing, and sorry to go off track here. I'm looking at it right now, and it says he was also in The Legend of Billy Jean, and he played a character called Ringwald. Mm. As in... Almost, almost sounds like Molly Ringwald. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of got that too. <clears throat> so, as we, as this movie goes on, uh, they start, they start putting the pieces together. Who's robbing who here? And what it's, what it's starting to look like is. Dennis Hopper hired these goons to rob his own casino. It's, uh... It, it's... It's not really explained as to why you would do that. But... Uh... I guess maybe there's an insurance scam going on. But mainly he also... He also doesn't want to pay money to the... 
uh, to a, a mob boss played by Peter Coyote. And here's the here's the catch. Where does Peter Weller come in in all this? Mm-hmm. Oh, the money that he won at the casino is the money that is supposed to go to Peter Coyote. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this film pretty much ends with, uh, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna give out I'm not gonna give out too too many spoilers for the ending, but let's just nope. say by the end, uh, you you're kind of stuck trying to figure out who's ripping off who here. And uh, that's when they when they do figure it out, and and they do it it kind of catches you off guard a little bit, but you're you're not uh, you're not here for the thinking. You're just here for seeing how many gunshots can go off and how many people can land, how many thugs can land on a on a a slot machine and hit the jackpot. Hey, spoiler alert, that happens in the film. So it's like an action film, most likely? There's a lot of action in it? Yeah, there's... There's just a lot of action and not a lot of thought being put into... Into, uh... You know, making you think. Is it a... Is it a good movie? I'd, I'd say it, it's actually a, a fairly decent film, but I just... I just wanted to pick that one up because I had to have something Dennis Hopper, and it was available. Exactly, that's what I was thinking when I was first like, oh shoot, what Dennis Hopper film should I choose? And it's kind of an interesting choice because, like I said, so many people, so many recognizable faces are in the film. Yeah, are in it, and it's uh, it's. Something that uh, I guarantee no one out there has really, really heard about. No, it's a very underrated film. Well, it might as it might just be perfectly well rated because uh, you know you have to decide whether or not you actually want to go see it. <laughs> right. After this, it's 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 your type of movie. I'll t- I'll say that, Mike. Oh, I know. I'm hearing it. I just did a trailer for it, and I was like, okay, okay, I can do this. Mm-hmm. But, uh, because of what I'm hearing, I'm like, it's a nice film for maybe an 80s film. I was like, oh my gosh, my, that's my shtick, man. But, uh, the, the, the question I'm gonna put on to you is, um, how is, how is Dennis Hopper, how, how is his performance as the bad guy, the villain of the film? How, how, how is that? Well, Hopper is the villain. We all know that by this time, especially judging by our other our other films that we have listed up for the evening here, that he had a he had a, a thing for doing so. And this is just uh, I'm gonna say he did a good job here because hey, you know what? At this point, you might as well. If you're going to be a villain actor, you might as well own it, and that's what that's what he's that's what he's doing. Mm-hmm. I mean, even when in the beginning there's a very beginning scene, there's a a guy who's holding him up at gunpoint, and he <laughs> uh, he's. I, I can't remember exactly what was said, but he's not afraid to give this guy a piece of his mind while he's at gunpoint here. All right. So if he, if that's any in indi- indication, then, then yeah, Dennis Hopper did a good job. And this is like one of the later films in the '90s. Like it was '97, I believe, when it came out. So compared to the other two films that are kind of early 90s. So, mm-hmm. which I kind of figured you'd do Top of the World, so that's why I'm going backwards in time. So, 
Uh, I'm, like I said, I'm totally, I'm willing to see that cuz it's on Netflix currently and Better watch it before they switch the catalog up again. [laughs] Otherwise I won't see it ever cuz I don't even have it on DVD for Netflix, so it's like a once in a blue moon like instant quo thing, you gotta do. [noise] Uh, and yes, here is my backpack, going in the washing machine. [laughs] [laughs] Yeah Done. [laughs] Dun dun dun, dun 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 He says while wearing an evil turtleneck sweater. [laughs] [laughs] It also got on my sweater. You know I, I uh, that that's the embarrassing thing is that I couldn't, I couldn't go home today because uh because we were I had to get picked up and go off to a family event. Right Uh somewhere else, so I'm I'm spending the whole day in a In a sweater that smells like cat pee or beer and I can't figure out which one it is. Is it the Animal House one? [laughs] Well, you know. Animal House? [laughs] [laughs] Oh yeah, that's been there for a while and then they changed it all. [laughs] Why? Really? Yeah, well, before it was just unlocked. They just opened a and then we had to wait a while to get it back. Mhm. Gross. I mean, I get it like in a Westernized country, but I don't like the idea of being carried around with soap all over my body. [laughs] Cuz that's what they're worried about. We're safe. Housing is safe. Children are safe. [laughs] [laughs] Uh, I think the kitchen's safe. Oh yeah, it's always safe. Yeah. You don't wanna be sitting across from a bunch of other people. Or a shower head that's leaking. Right, right. It's always safe to be in your own home. With a shower head. [laughs] [laughs] Reserve the rest to use for the whole day. Or as many as you want, right? Uh, we gotta take the big one out. And then the small one has to go in the middle. Aw, man. You can't have just one carpet sitting in the middle. Grab the whole carpet and then just throw it in the middle. Yeah, or there's a whole row open in the back of the room and then we can have like Well, we're not gonna make your life that much easier. I want you to have a baby. [laughs] Yeah, no. [laughs] [laughs] I want, I want, I want you to have a baby. Baby bear. Yeah. Yeah, baby bear. Big Big bear Arjan. Yeah. [laughs] Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. [laughs] Um Hey. Woah, Shand's making moves. Um, do I cut her off? Yep, just put a blue one in there. Okay. I think that's about good enough for me. Yeah. Oh wow, she's coming in hot. [laughs] Yeah she's coming in hot, man. She's gonna bring a lot of heat. Um Yeah, she's gonna bring a lot of heat. Um I'm so excited for her. And [laughs] and then Mm. [laughs] We're gonna have our um our group mega lunch. Yep. Yeah Cuz it's gonna be gonna be awesome. It's gonna be uh deep dish pasta thing. Pasta, mega lunch? We love pasta. Yeah. Yeah, let's go for it. I have fire retardant. Domestic three. [laughs] That's not too many calories for ha- for just putting it on a plate. Yeah, exactly. Well, you gotta think of it like that. When you're buying it's gonna be super stretchy, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. It's it's gonna it's gonna keep you Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Totally. No, it's gonna keep you guys together. Well, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's the key. [laughs] It's like a mix of everything. We're gonna eat here and there, right? [noise] Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. [laughs] Yeah. Sounds great. [laughs] Mhm. Yeah, I really wanna enjoy it. Well, we'll see what we can do. [noise] Hmm. [noise] Just hope this is enough food. Should be fine. Yeah should be fine. Are we gonna be able to finish all of that? Like, do you think we can finish all of that? Like, do you have enough room? What can we do? Make it a whole pottery batch. Mhm. Yeah. We could do that, sure. Cuz we gotta do, like, two pots of oil so everyone has half of each thing probably. Yeah, and then we'll be able to make steak too. Yeah it's gonna be super stretchy, that pot. But steak is probably the best part about steak. Oh, you got a point there. Steak is so good. Uh yeah, but how are we gonna finish it? Oh, no. Oh, actually no, never mind. Mine, mine would be better if I had more room cuz this was a lot easier. Should we bring the table to you guys? Or you guys can come sit on the table if you want? You can sit on the table. Oh no, I'm not okay, we have five. Well, we can sit on the table, for now. Yeah, we can do that. Here. How many people can sit on the table? Mm, you don't have to. Just have to watch us. Oh okay, yeah. That's all. Yeah. Oh yeah, we cleaned it before you guys came in, so Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Something something about that patio feels like it's gonna be really clean when we get there cuz our balcony's like right there. Yeah. Ours is really gross, so [laughs] Yeah, cuz we didn't have enough room in our balcony. Yeah. Ours is always really gross. Yeah. Like this? Yeah, our balcony is always really gross. Um It was either that or we didn't have enough space in our balcony. Cuz like, the top Yeah. Yeah, the top drawer was just coming up. Yeah, so basically we had to dump a bunch of stuff that was coming up through the front door which we can't really get rid of. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Clean this up. And we can have a nice breeze, but the direct sunshine is even more unbearable, so Mm. Mm. Wow. So, you you're lucky. Yeah. It was just it was one or the othe- I know. Cuz like, I don't think we'd be able to leave that much stuff in our balcony. Yeah, like that's what I was thinking. But ours clearly didn't get that much uh use cuz it was it was raining up there like three days in a row. [laughs] Oh, yeah, my balcony got washed. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Yeah. That, that's fun. Fun. Yeah. Yeah, this part's really fun because you get to see the mountains from here. It's it's like a big party. Mmm. It's gonna be a mountain party. [noise] Cuz we're gonna be camping out here in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna get that. Oh, I thought that was for like a flash mob thing. No, it's just it's just like we had that place last year, remember? Yeah, the one that I was talking about? That that Canadian one? Yeah, the Canadian one. Oh yeah, the Surrey Paddle Thing, whatever it's called. It's going to be on like three acres of fenced land just like that little patch in the back there, right? Oh, that's really good. Yeah. That one's gonna be so fun. That one's gonna be actually kinda fun to get to know, right? All the people. Yeah, yeah. All the people, yeah. Yeah, that's what I think is gonna be fun, actually, about tomorrow is that people will not drive around in circles. Yeah, because they're gonna be so far. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. [laughs] Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is probably gonna be good thing. Yeah, yeah, that's the main thing that drives me up the wall. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I feel like people will start doing that anyways. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is getting more popular. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Popularity goes up for sure. [laughs]
And that's why it's got that glorious sort of uh, post-apocalyptic, uh, grungy, earthy tone hue. Hmm. So I'm just going to skip the um, a lot of the trivia, and I'll just skim on a few things lightly. Because there's some things I can confirm, some things I can't confirm. So I'm just going to discuss the movie as a whole and talk about some productional facts. But nothing too, too major. Um, of course, at the time, this was the most expensive film ever made because they had actual sets and stuff built miles and miles away from inland. I'm not even kidding. They shot this thing off of Hawaii, if I remember correctly. So they actually did have, like, sets and stuff built, which is pretty cool. They didn't have any sound stages or anything. Um, if they nice. Didn't, probably, which is nice. Um, there were a couple of storms that caused havoc to the production, so they had to rebuild some of the sets. Um, there was a point where Kevin Costner had an affair with one of the girls on Hawaii, which caused a huge, interesting, dramatic breakup with his wife, which wasn't so good. Mm -mm. Not to mention, yeah, it's it, it's best not mentioning. Uh, Tina Majuro, who plays the girl in the film Anola, she got stung by countless jellyfish, causing Kevin Costner to nickname her Jellyfish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they just wanted like, some food! Food! Oh, I'll food! Get I'll get that scene later. Um, the Trimarian surprisingly still exists. It still exists, and the last I heard, they took the boat and they rebuilt it to an actual working Trimarian. So, if you want to know where it is to this day, it's still being used as a boat, which is actually pretty nice. This movie in general, it caught my attention as a kid pretty much just for the setting in general. I like the idea. Okay, it's a little absurd, but it's amazing seeing this world, seeing these little cities, seeing everyone trying to survive, and in a sense, yeah, it's Mad Max, only instead of the desert, it's on water. It's a, it's a ridiculous premise, but what makes it work so well is the people and the situations and how this whole world is sort of set up. It really gives you a lot of viewings to sort of get an idea of what the world is like. And as you're watching it, you're more focused on the world in general and less on the characters. But it is your basic straight-up action shoot 'em kind of scenario. You have Kevin Costner, who's this half-man, half-fish. Which I know we kept joking was like this merman, merfish, or whatever. Mm -hmm. the, only thing, the only thing missing is Barnacle Boy. And apparently he, spoiler alert, may or may not know some information about the secret to the existence of dry land, which some people consider a myth. Which they say is the only piece of land that is floating on top of water. And it's weird when you consider the fact this is supposed to be set somewhere in 2500 or something like that. I don't know, it's very vague. So apparently, supposedly, this kid has the key to finding dry land, which is a tattoo on her back, mm -hmm. which has all these Japanese, Chinese symbols that supposedly are, like, coordinates and directions to it. Latitude or longitude coordinates. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. Again, uh, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome had a city running on pig shit, so I can believe anything. <laughs> The whole movie was running on pig shit. <laughs> hey, 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 the fight in the Thunderdome was actually not, was actually pretty cool. Um, <laughs> sorry, I have allergies. Um, so yeah, as you can expect, um, the Mariner, played by Kevin Costner, picks up the girl and her caretaker um, with her, and he has to deal with their whininess and he has to deal with his aloneness until he finally realizes maybe there is a connection to these people and how to get the dry land again it's in, in, in it's theatrical cut it's a very basic very standard apocalyptic action kind of film what you see is what you get i like the production values of this movie i really like the effort they took in to make these cities full on water probably one of my favorite sets aside from the atoll is the deeds that giant oil tanker <laughs> Uh -huh. There's like mm -hmm. a really good, there's like a really good payoff where the villain, which we'll get into in a second, where he looks at a um, picture of one of the runners. I think he's a Russian oiler. And the biggest payoff is, of course, this whole time they're living in his ship, which is still on the float. 
And the irony is that eons ago, this is true, the ship had a huge oil spill. Yeah, so were there... They're being very subtle with their environmentalism there. Sting would love this movie. He's an environmentalist, what can I say? Um, what makes this movie work so well, aside from the technicals, and maybe some of the story, because there is some character development, but I'll get to that in a second. What makes the movie work a whole lot, and is worth seeing, is the centerpiece of all Dennis Hopper as the deacon. Oh, and, I yes. to, and I have to admit, this is probably next to his character in Blue Velvet, one of my favorite Dennis Hopper villains. I don't know how they're able to take this religious evangelist and make him a straight up bad guy. It's just so interesting. He has like a high patch and he's really grimacing and tossing all this one lighter jargon. The, the way Dennis does it is just amazing. You could have hired anyone to be in that role. Just, just anyone, but somehow Dennis takes it and he just really makes it sparkle. I don't know, if he, I don't know what magic he had to pull that off, but it's just incredible. Well, maybe, uh, maybe he was originally envisioned here by William Shatner, you know, and being inspired by a televangelist, and how they... <laughs> now, now, if he, now, if he was in Star Trek V, that movie would have gotten an R rating, and I would love to see that version. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there you go! Oh, Get your geez. ass off the Enterprise and you take over! Um... His character in Waterworld is especially interesting. Of course, he's going after Dryland as well. His motives are explained better in a different version, especially considering the extended version has not only a lot more character development with the Mariner that explains his loneliness, um, and probably one of my favorite scenes where he's, he's told that he's pitied and he doesn't understand the meaning of the word, and he goes and looks at some National Geographic magazines and understand it. But certainly a lot more Dennis Hopper too. There's a couple of great scenes which I'm really angry to see are not in the theatrical cut, which are, are very well done. Like there's this one scene where he's interrogating um, two people about where the girl Enola went as the secret of dry land, and when one of the guys brings up that a mute or safe or something like that, he has this whole sermon that. I swear to God, I always keep trying and quoting this whole sermon about the evolution of the world. He's like, let's have an intelligent conversation. I'll talk and you listen. In the beginning, God said the seas rose, and they did. He created everything. The sun, the air we breathe. He also made man and fish and no other combination alike. He does not abide the notion of evolution. And in a way, it just seems like he's channeling his character, the Sheriff, from Texas Chainsaw John Massacre 2, by the way. Like, this is my world, and I'm controlling it. This is what I say, and this is what it goes. The fact that he's taking this high arc of, you know, religion, you know, reverend, you know, saying all the sermon, all that sort of stuff, and just really abusing it is just hilarious. And well, they have... Everyone knows, though, Dennis Hopper believes in evolution. We all know he came from a dinosaur. We'll get, we'll, 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 we'll get to that one later. We'll get to, we'll that, get, one later. We'll get to that. You're jumping the gun there, James. <laughs> the okay. Other great, the other great scene is later when he's um, into, interrogating Enola, and there's a lot of great dialogue where he goes off about how his um, parish or his group of people, the smokers, are the Church of Eternal Growth, and the fact that he clearly hints on that they need more land to make more people. And I remember seeing that first time around, I kept thinking to myself, uh, I take it Catholicism is still existing in this world. Catholicism? Thank you, so you have, oh, Catholicism, thank you. So you sort of have that dynamic of different religions and stuff that exists in this universe, which is really, no pun intended, watered down a theatrical cut. Because mm. even his character, it's still a lot of fun to watch in the theatrical version, but in the extended version, he really has a motive. He really has a definitive gaining motive. He wants to take dry land and commercialize it. 
again, just like any TV evangelist, they see something, they go after it. They're, we preach the word of God, so send us money so we can give you the good news. Now for him. Um, and that's what I really love about this character in the longer cut. Because when you really get down to it, he's more than just an evil guy. He's an evil guy that can take any form of property and just exploit it. There's even the scene, again, the longer version, where he's obsessed with golfing. And he turns over to, like, this painting of dry land, and he wants to turn into a resort. Like, Salvation! 18 holes! Acre 32! <laughs> and you see all these, like, little shops and resorts together, and it's just amazing. You know, there was a... There was a, a point in the film where where he was evangelizing, and I, I, I think we were watching this together, and I said, Well, oh yeah... For the audience who doesn't realize this, uh, early on in the film, Dennis Hopper loses an eye. We don't see how this happens. We just see the uh, we just see the uh, the after effects. And my goodness, it was great makeup. Oh yeah. But uh, but um, as he's evangelizing you now to this to this crowd that works for him. Uh, I remember saying to myself, oh my goodness, he's a blind prophet. He couldn't fit his character enough. It's... I... It, it's an obvious... It, it's something that you look at now and say, okay, this is a bit of symbolism that they decided to add in there to be cute. So, go on. Yeah, I was about to say, it's a shame they cut a lot of those scenes out because they define his character a whole lot more from just a generic action uh, villain. They really make him sort of this very, very evil sort of person taking something that, you know, is wholesome and decent and really twisting it a lot. And I think without those scenes... It really defines his character as this straight up shoot 'em, I'm going after this land because plot says so kind of motif. We're evil, we need something to go after, like buried treasure, the like pirates are on a board. With that material ingested in, it really sets up the world a little more in what every person is going after in terms of this quote unquote mythical bit of dry land. Dennis Hopper really defines this character. He really owns this role. When you look at the villains that he's played in the 80s or so, he really doesn't hold back. He really, really doesn't hold back. Um, a film I wanted to talk about, but um, but vetoed over this one because it was too dark, was Blue Velvet. And just the way he's controlling this girlfriend and really abusing her to his own pleasure is not only disturbing but creepy at the same time. It's just so interesting seeing this very dark, very twisted, wild version of humanity that you really look at as more of a mirror reflection, like hey, what if this could be me? What if this was, you know, this kind of person, this all-out person, not holding back, going completely insane. Like, like literally, the way he inhales the gas and misabuses as a drug is just so unique to watch, especially the scenes where he's intimidating Colin McLaughlin, which is perfect. Um, in Waterworld, he kind of, he, he, you kind of see little signs of that. Like, like a lot of that means he's onto something, when he knows he's onto the fact that, oh, we're getting close to the dry land, and then there's a bit of a setback, he's like, yes, yes, we're going, oh, oh, I see, well, this is going to be a little harder than we thought, and the fact he really takes his anger out is just so interesting, it's not drastic or whatever, but verbally, you can really feel that coming out of him, especially in the scene where he's talking to Enola, he's like, oh, I don't give a shit what he like, he took out my eye, he can say what's, what's left to you in a goddamn jar. You can really feel that frustration coming out of him, because they have, like, the holy grail, and they don't know how to use it. And that's just so interesting seeing that. Um, now, of course, as you may know, as, I'm, as I was talking about, there is a longer version, and I'm a little ticked to see Doug didn't bring that up in his review, but okay, fine, all the power to him, he said the movie's okay, so I'm not going to be too angry. Um, the movie was a near three-hour length, 
And if I remember the story correctly, um, the director, Kevin Reynolds, had problems trying to get his version out there. And Universal wanted a quicker, faster kind of film. Um, some people say it was a falling out between him and Kevin Costner. I can't confirm you the stories, but what I can say is that the film was really hacked down. I mean, really, really hacked down. And so the film was at a length of two hours and like 16 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. um, later, it premiered on ABC in 1998 or 1997, and it was a two-night event, and it had a lot of additional material added in, aside from the obvious being profanity and violence cut, because, well, you know, we can't show Janine Triple Horn's butt on television. Darn it. We'd like to. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> though... Thankfully, it wouldn't be until later on, thanks to the cult status of DVD sales, I guess, finally, somewhere down the line, Universal went up, and they actually released this extended version, as I hope you're seeing here, it's a two-disc edition. Ooh. Um, Ooh. It's really nice to see them finally release this cut, they did the same thing with uh, Dune as well, but there's a huge drawback. The master, or the print, that they used for this um, DVD edition. They, it, it's in widescreen, that's, that's kind of a plus. The bad news, they use the master they used for ABC network airings, which means a lot of stuff got censored. The, the film's there, mm. the, the film's there, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but a lot of the violence and a lot of the nudity and language that was trimmed out of the network broadcast versions, this is that cut. I don't know, maybe they're too cheap to restore it, maybe the print they had was not good enough and they decided to slap it on there for collector's value. It's a bit of a shame, but there have been some fan restorations going around here and there. Um, as much as I would love to see a complete version as everyone else would, this is the complete cut that we're going to get so far. I highly recommend checking it out. There's a lot more character scenes, a lot more action. Um, a lot of plot holes get covered up, which are actually pretty nice. Um, if you bite the ball and get past all the edited violence and stuff, you'll be fine, because there's a whole lot more to it than just gratuitous action, and special effects, and generic one-liners. There's a lot more to the Mariner, as we pity him as a character that just wants to be a loner and just be left alone. He's not an anti-hero or someone to despise easily. He just literally has been alone all his life. He has no contact or socialization. The only thing is really his boat. That's how I saw it. And that's how the film paints it here. I guess the studios felt marketing that would be difficult, so it's obvious why they cut scenes out. Like him revealing that he was actually going to sell a Nola of... Gene's character to a slave colony, um, which really adds a lot of dramatic tension. Because it's sort of like, oh, just when you're going to warm up to this guy, they throw in a 360 turn. Which makes it all more interesting, because you kind of question exactly how much human emotion he has. And then near the end or so, he finally decides, okay, fine, I'm going to go save her, but it's because she's a good friend, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And yet it's more complex and longer version, which they do pretty nice. The biggest twist of all I find interesting that I think would have been fine keeping in is the reveal of dry land, and this is a huge spoiler. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it's possible, but it's it's a nice little twist at the end. I guess it's like their little Statue of Liberty moment for Planet of the Apes, mm -hmm. where it's revealed that dry land is actually one of the tallest places in the world. I'm not going to give too much away, because this version does exist and you can buy it, um, hopefully, on certain DVD shops, if not, you can find online, which is pretty good. But that little twist there, really, it, it feels plausible. It feels plausible. There's some extent where we can sort of accept it, but at the same time, it's kind of like, okay, it's absurd, but it works on that level. In the same way as Earth blowing itself up and having a world full of apes. Go figure. Um, 
there, there's a lot of the stuff that works pretty well. Again, a lot of special effects are great. For love of God, please do check this out. It's getting a lot of renewal, a lot of second viewings. It's really not that bad, and to be honest, it's better than The Postman, which was trying to be a political film, I guess. Um, the only reason I can think people why I don't like this movie is because when you really break down the cliches, it's a western in the skin of an apocalyptic movie, when you really think about that. Well, yeah. Really think about that. You have the loner coming into a new town, the people in the town hate the newcomer, the town gets shot down, you have them in the covered wagon, or in this case the ship, going along the ocean, you have them coming across something new, people adjust something new, but the hero decides he wants to either move out of town or stay with them, and like in the most cliche of westerns, he decides to go back to his own familiar place or move on to the next town. Uh, he's practically riding off through the sunset at the end of the film. Kevin Costner is a staple of westerns, like Dances with Wolves in a way. Mm -hmm. And this is a crazy conspiracy theory I have, but I think the reason why people didn't like this film, not just because it was okay standard action, but a lot of people really didn't like westerns. Oh yeah, there, that's... There, I mean, when you think about it, 90s was the dying trend of westerns. You had stuff like Tombstone that worked. Mm -hmm. But then you had other things that just weren't working as well. And I wish I could think of some examples of the fly, but the only one I can think of today really is like something along the lines of the Lone Ranger or uh, three. I, I don't know. If, well, then again, um, what was it? The remake for True Grid worked. Mm -hmm. It was more of a case where people wanted, you know, new stuff. They didn't want to see the past. Mm -hmm. And when you really do think about it, Waterworld is a western, just yeah. with water instead of desert. Mm -hmm. which, which makes it more interesting when you do think about it. Exactly. Taking tropes. And when you really do think about it, a lot of science fiction films out there have done the same thing, like Star Wars and all other stuff. So, um, please, for love of goodness, take my advice. Give this film a second chance. Watch the longer version. It may be three hours, but oh my god, it's worth it. It, it really is. And you can trust that... I, I can second that as a guy who saw this movie in theaters when it was out. I I remember going to see this with my with the pastor of a church I was going to at the time, which uh, did he for the time being the did did he believe in the vicinity of taking urine and diluting it into water? No. Nope. Just ask. Just not ask. As, not as far as I know. Uh, for the moment, for that moment in time, uh, just, just thinking about that, though, looking back on that, before he became a bit of a power-hungry type, uh, it's a long story, but for the moment I, in there, I thought he, this sort of made him one of the coolest pastors ever, but, um, <laughs> uh, but it, it's not to say that I wasn't, let's see, I was, what, 11, 12? Going to see this, I was kind of taken aback by a lot of the, a lot of the stuff in the film, the missing eyeball, the Janine Triplehorn's ass, oh. and uh, I, I was one of those kids that was that would just sort of be like sitting in the audience, oh, you know, uh, right, because you're a kid. I mean, you're not. I was, I was almost like that during Titanic, and I saw Kate Moon's boobs, and I said, nope, everything's fine. <laughs> Yeah. And, I was, and I was seven at the time. Well, yeah. Wow, you learned quick, eh? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Gee, no wonder you're uh, not going there. Can't That's my story for. I'll, I'll, I'll explain after Mike. I'll explain after. I'm not gonna go there. So. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay. It's okay. We're friends. We're friends. I know. I just don't want to cross those lines. Um. So. So. Um. I wanted to, I was I was just waiting for everybody to do their spiel cuz I swear to god you guys have to see Waterworld. You guys have to go watch it. I'm the third person to agree with this. I, it is Mad Max on fucking water. Guaranteed. And oh, oh, it's, it's Mad, 
They even got Michael Jetter in a flying machine. Yes. Who doesn't like that? It's Michael Jetter. You can yeah. do anything. Exactly. I mean, oh, oh, it's Mad Max rip off, blah, blah, blah. It's like, so uh, what? It's, it's, it's that's as, the point. And as stated earlier, the same cinematographer of Road Warrior was also the cinematographer for this film, so suck it. Yes, yeah, suck it, people. I mean, I, I, I could go on about how Mad Max influenced a lot of post-apocalyptic rip-offs, but this one, it takes the cake, like, it's different. It's like, it's set in water. It's like, the world building in this is freaking amazing. I like the world building. It caught me. Boom. Um, Dennis Hopper's villain, the Deacon, he's actually a pretty good villain. Like, I was, like, really, like, holy crap, that's actually really good. Um... When it comes, like, I'm a sucker for post-apocalyptic films. I'm a fan of Mad Max. Hell, I even saw Mad Max Fury Road this weekend, so I, I'm a sucker for it, so. And Waterworld is no, is just the same. It's just, like, something happens. They have to survive it. Move on. It's, it's actually one of my, Waterworld has become, a, I'm a list of favorites. Like, I have the cut that Morgan gave me, and I'll probably watch it over and over and over and over again thanks to Morgan um I just seriously give it a second fucking chance it's Waterworld so what if it was it, it's just the cinematography is amazing like we all mentioned Ro the road warrior cinematographer hello I, I I'm just flabbergasted because mm -hmm. people don't seem it, it, it's a cult of film. I, I, I like that fact. It's like, oh, it's gaining a cult following. And here's the here's the strange thing about this film and what legacy it leaves behind. So this is just the interesting thing to think about is that Universal Hollywood, Singapore, and Japan have a theme park attraction of Waterworld. And it's, and it's still running to this day, 20 years later. What is oh, with, yeah. what is with that? It's like the film didn't go that well, but the attraction is succeeding twenty years later. What has society come to with this? And this movie is already number twenty three on my top fifty favorite films list. It's yeah, just... I did I did see the I did see the uh, the theme park attraction. It's oh uh, the it it it's kind of. It, it's even campier than the than the climax of the film, but you know what? It's a theme park attraction. You're gonna give it. You're you're gonna watch people dive off of high places, get shot. You're gonna you're gonna see all that, and water skis, and you're gonna love it because and, it's all happening right there. Oh yeah. It, it can't be as campier as what I remember seeing as a kid. And please hear me out. If the clip is out there, please upload to YouTube. On the Rosie O'Donnell show, there was one point where she visited the Waterworld attraction and she became a part of it. And the story was her battling against the smokers. I swear, I'm not even kidding. I'm not even kidding. This is true. I remember this. This is still deep in my memory. I'm, hear me out. She battled the smokers over the last Tickle Me Elmo doll. And there's a really great moment where she's on a jet ski and one of the smokers drop it and you hear going, Elmo go, and you hear Elmo going ah, 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 just laughing all the way down and she catches it just right before it hits the water. Oh I no. still I still remember that vividly. Please, please upload that scene. Two other highlights from the longer cut, and I'm gonna be very brief. Um there's one with the trial scene with the eight holders where they talk about the mariner and what to do with him after they capture him. And they find some items from his boat. One of them takes a yo-yo and it's like, This is for strangling people! One of them takes a clarinet and goes, This is for, like, listening to people! And then my favorite one is where they take up the thigh master and he starts going in there he's like, We don't know what this is! This is like some sort of torture device! That was, that was a great part, actually. I laughed at that part. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great self-torture device, you know? You, you put yourself through it. No pain, no gain. You, you get more of Jack Black, too, in his Oscar-nominated moment. <laughs> yes, Jack Black is in this fucking film. If... Which, which 
sadly, sadly, a good bulk of his character was on the cutting room floor, but thankfully it's back in this version. There's your reason. If you want to see Jack Black in a rare-ish cameo in the film, check it out. And actually act. And, and, damn good acting. Like, not in, so... In, in, in the 1990s. In the in 90s. The, in the 90s. Good acting in the 90s, that is, yeah. It's just... This, this film is just something you should just take in. Like, the theme park attraction is doing well. And, and honestly, after the film, I... After seeing it with these guys, I actually, like, thought, like, wait, could, Universal could do something with this. Like, they have the theme park attraction. I mean, the, Universal could just, like, do something with it. Like, do another film or even do a TV series, which I was thinking of. And it got me thinking, like, okay, if they did a TV series, what would they do? It's like, what's the connection between the film and then the TV series they would do? And I, and I thought of a pretty good, like, l like premise for it. Like, um... It's if you watch the film, you know the child actor Nola is in this. I don't, and uh, she's like at, what was like ten years old at least in the film back in '95, and now it's like twenty years later. She's older now, so it makes sense to have her as like the main lead in it. You know, we have her tell her side of the story. You know, you know, twenty years later. Oh, here she's still surviving on this dry land. You know, and they, she's controlling this new group of these survivors and they try to survive Waterworld as they encounter new foes maybe the smokers maybe some other new people you know and it, it explores the world building even more beyond and it it, it, it will take it, it's much more better than a film because then it would take each episode to build a character in the world building and seriously <laughs> Universal if you ever listening which I highly doubt. Maybe I'll send an email to you guys somehow. I don't know. I want to pitch this show to you. You have to fucking do this. For the love of God. Bring Waterworld back. Somehow. I actually am in support. Well, what if we could... have... Oh, really? Yeah. I think this deserves a reboot. Yes. It needs... Yeah, there... It needs a reboot. It... Yeah. It... It needs some kind of fresh take on it. Like, you need to expand it. Like, again, do something like the expanding universe of Star Wars, or, you know, maybe something along the lines of Star Trek, or I think you proposed, like, a TV miniseries at one point? Yeah, it was something like that. It was a miniseries, or even, like, a full-fledged, like, Netflix, you know, series they can do, or, like, a on primetime TV, maybe, like, a, like a full series. I mean, it, anything, like... I think a series would be actually a pretty logistic way. It's a it's a legitimate like way to do it. Like you do the film, sure. Okay, theme park attraction. Okay, good. Uh, TV series, go for it. I mean, you, there's comics on Waterworld. There's a novel. So you, why don't you just go with the TV series route? It's the only next option you can do. There's Indeed. Another, there's no other media to go into. You got all the media's covered pretty much. Even video games. Like you got that covered back in the '90s, even though they're Pretty crap here. I didn't think Mortal Kombat was that bad. Could have been um, worse. What? I, I, what? Oh, uh, no, he was talking about uh, the Waterworld video game for the Virtual Boy. It does look like shit. It feels like gold shit. <laughs> So, yes, people, go get Waterworld. Get Waterworld, for fuck's sake, because it's worth it. Buy this movie! This version! Buy this version! Don't buy the Blu-ray! Buy this one! No pressure. It's, it's two disc. Oh, yes, I was going to mention the connection between this one and Dune. This was released the same year when they had a special edition version of Dune called Extended Edition. Uh-huh. Guess what? They release a near three-hour version of Dune. Same thing as Waterworld. It's the print master they use for the television <laughs> syndication. Oh, my God. What are they going to do next? An extended version of Jingle All the Way? <gasps> there you... <laughs> okay. Yeah, I went there. Buy it. Buy it. 
Okay. I've been leading this to the big one. One of the... I was debating which film I wanted to do. I was that top of the world at first, but after watching Waterworld, I was like, fuck it. Fuck it. I'm going to go back and watch Super Mario Brothers the movie. Really? Because I thought it was Apocalypse Now. He was the hit. Oh, yeah, he was in that. Yeah, he was in that, but... I do... I swear, because I double-checked, we briefly mentioned this during our, obviously, the video games based, uh, movies based on video games, we didn't fully talk about it, Matt talked about it briefly, but we didn't go full death, and I was like, fuck it, let's just talk about this full death, with Dennis Hopper being King Koopa in the film, and this is like the one of the earliest, this is, came out in 93, and... <sighs> Where do I begin? At the beginning, of course. Uh, start with the guilty and finish with the pleasure. Of course, because it is a guilty pleasure movie. Like, I don't... I can understand the hate on it. It was the first video game movie ever. I understand that. It had two directors and, I believe, three writers to do this. And they tried their fucking best to make a Super Mario Bros. movie. And what they did is basically a Super Mario Bros. movie. They eventually have to save a princess from a castle, which was the point of the fucking game. Which they did. But they added so much more to the film. Like, there's a whole movie where, oh, the asteroid came, kill off the dinosaurs, but... What if they survived in an alternate dimension where they evolved into humans? You know, they from dinosaurs, lizards to humans to monkeys and to humans and and. <sighs> mm -hmm. Homer Simpson explained it better. And yes, yes, Den Kles Kalanas. Den Kassanetta. Thanks. He did the helping narration for the film, and it's the cheesy animation. <laughs> I thought that it was. I used to think that was Bob Hoskins doing that opening bit of narration, but I guess not. No, it was I Homer. We watched it. It was Homer Simpson. It's Homer Simpson trying to be, trying to be a Mario. Trying to do an Italian Brooklyn accent. <laughs> uh, so. Obviously, you have the Mario Bros, who are actual plumbers in this film, with, you know, Bob Hoskins being Mario and John Leguizamo playing uh, Luigi. Which is the weirdest thing. You got a British actor playing an Italian plumber, and you got a Hispanic actor playing a Italian plumber. It, why? Why the nationalities? But of course, Bob Hoskins has that Brooklyn accent, which you can hear him do in uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which you can kind of compare in a sense. Like, you can kind of compare the characters. Like, Eddie Valiant and Mario have the same accents. You can sound the same, and I don't know, not the motives or anything with the characters, but. Uh, Actually, I think his accent in this movie is a lot stronger. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh yeah, I uh, I did a lot of. What is this? <laughs> I did do some. I I watched the movie again, and then I wa did some additional research where I saw people's like reviews of it and even Doug's review of it, and he was like, he sounds like he's coughing up a hairball most of the time. Hmm. Come on, Mario, where's your sense of humor? <laughs> oh my God, so. Of course, Dennis Hopper. Uh, Dennis Hopper plays oh, King Koopa. Uh, but wait a minute, where's Bowser? He's supposed to play Bowser. Oh my God, it's not the yeah, Mario. It was King Koopa in the Japanese version. Bowser, King Koopa, same, same, same dude. Same, same, same freaking thing. Yeah, it was Princess Toad still in the Japanese version. That Princess Peach. And of course, in this film, you got Princess Daisy. It's like, 
What? Princess Daisy? From Super Mario Land? <laughs> Why? Oh sure, and Mario gets on with Big Bertha the Fish from Super Mario 3? Or was it Super Mario World? Not one of the two. It's, it's 3, I believe. Yeah, and yeah, big. We actually, Mike and I actually had this debate while we were watching this film. Like, they have this scene where they dance with each other, and I was like, "Okay, Mike, time for the big question: Big Bertha, hot or not?" <laughs> I swear, this is like some conversation. I was like, you know what? Back in '93, Big Bertha, the actress playing her, it's not so bad. I could take that. I could slap that. And she's got curves, you know? She's got- she's a curvy hey, black woman. Hey, 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 Her and Queen Latifah, any day. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If it helps, the last thing she did was Wilfred, Bad Judge, and she appeared in an episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, so she's doing television work. Yeah, I was gonna say, she does a lot of television work. She's still acting in the biz, which is kind of cool. And yes, the movie has a lot of references to the game, which is nice. You hear a couple of sound effects in the background, which are pretty thwomp. nice, too. Uh, the Thwomp Boots. I <laughs> so fucking want the one. So, and a lot of people love that point. It's like, the Thwomp Boots, holy crap, they're amazing. And I, I guess... Sorry, go on. Go, you go on. I guess they have to... I guess that's one that's one thing that they feel like they have to explain, you know, the boots. Here was here was the um the big seller of the game was that you could jump unusually high and you could uh and you could get special abilities like flying. So I guess the with the film adaptation here's here's where they technically screw up but they but you realize you take a step back and you say, "Well, look at what they had to work." With. Oh yeah. Uh, um, with a with a film, you you typically feel the need to explain things, and uh, in the in the TV show, it was explained that because Mario and Luigi are entering another dimension, maybe there there's just less gravity in that dimension, therefore they can jump higher. Yes, um, it's true. According to the cartoon, you can get sucked down the drain. <laughs> in a in a in a movie, you you take a look at this movie, and you look back at the games, and you say, "Wait a minute, the the games are kind of hard to to interpret to begin with into mm -hmm. a live action format." Exactly. So that explains everything. That explains why they did what they did. Exactly, and they, and they have a reason. I mean, you've got the directors who are mostly known for um, Max Headroom, and they, and it, there's a lot of behind-the-scenes work behind uh, the Super Mario Bros. movie, just like how Waterworld had his behind-the-scenes debacle thing. So the script kept on changing, and then, of course, Bob Hoskins was just hating the whole experience. Like, this was the worst thing. And John Leguizamo was just kind of, kind of the same way. So they, they were drinking, so they were drunk on the set, having to, trying to make the best of it. And they tried their best with it. And for me, it's a guilty pleasure. And, of course, with Thwomp Boots, if you're wondering, it's named after the the Brock thing that comes down in the game. That's called, that called a Thwomp. I don't know why they... Turn that into boots. That's kind of weird. And they and they put mm. like, and the Thwomp boots are powered by bullet bills, which I don't understand why. And it's I don't... it was in the game, so it's there. <laughs> it's it's there. It's just there. So you have Dennis Hopper playing King Koopa. He wants to merge the two dimensions between the dinosaur dimension and then our Earth dimension into one and rule both like hit, rule into one big one and apparently as a minor motive turning everyone into monkeys <laughs> monkeys yes he wants monkeys. to turn all the humans into monkeys <laughs> so yes that's what he's trying to do and uh you know daisy falls into it mario's brothers has the saver defeat king koopa and uh <laughs> there's a running gag a running j I think joke is a key word. Where he's trying to order a pizza, and it doesn't work out that well. There's no payoff to the joke. 
Maybe it would have been funnier if the pizza guy gets in the middle of the whole fight. That would have been interesting. That would have been, like, but... Like, the... like, like, he's trying to deliver a slice as he's, like, throwing, like, flamethrowers and stuff, and he just, t and he just burns the pizza. I think it would have been funnier if that happened. That, that would have been, but there's... It's... <laughs> like, 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 maybe he just points the gun, he's like, Sir, what? And he toasts the pizza, and he's like, I think your pizza's burnt. And he's looking, and he goes, No, you did and he just... Burns the bastard just for no reason. <laughs> that would be Den cool. Dennis Hopper, he he plays it to the hammiest, cheesiest way possible. He's having a good time while p playing King Koopa. <laughs> I love his performance as King Koopa. You know, it's just like, oh, he's having a great time. You can see it in his face sometimes. Except for, ba -ba! <laughs> That face, but, ba -ba! Actually, the the line that I always think about with this film, and I don't know why I do it, but the, you know, there's you, you know what's coming. I know what's coming. I know what the line. Uh, he's he's bathing in mud at one point. He's just he's he's talking to this woman that he's that he's working with, and he says, "You know what Secretary. I like about secretary. You know what I like about mud." It's clean and it's dirty all at the same time. And he, <laughs> he he's having too much fun doing this. Yeah, he does, and this is like one of my favorites. Is just like, oh my god, he's so. Ins and that line I used too, because it's so true. It's like, yes, it's clean and dirty at the same time. <laughs> love that line. I love David Lynch's work. It's so clean and filthy at the same time. <laughs> Um, but, but that's the thing with the Super Mario Bros. movie, you know, you got the great King Koopa, you know, he's, Dennis Hopper's doing his thing, the Mario Bros., <laughs> what's your name, Mario, what's your name, <laughs> Luigi, shut up, Luigi, what's your name, Luigi. no, no, it's Mario Mario and Luigi Mario, <laughs> Mike, Mike, get these two Sweet. Marios cleaned up. No, no, no. His last name should be Squeegee. <laughs> or the other, the other one where they're in the car running after, and they see the report on the aliens. What we gotta deal with the aliens now, Luigi? We're the aliens. <laughs> that was a good one too. We are. Cool. Oh, yeah. Cool. Like Luigi, John Leguizamo is Luigi. <laughs> oh my God, he, he, he's adorable, geeky. Masculine guy. He's the just very, he's the sloth kind of guy. Before Romeo and Juliet schooled up his career. <laughs> it was before. Was, I think he was on methamphetamines when he was uh, doing this role. I mean, like I said, they were just drinking and all drunk and fucked up on the set. They were like having a good time trying to make the best of it. No, we're uh, on this cliff, Mario, and this giant booger sneezed us out. Ah, oh, come on. Hashtag trust the mushroom. Trust the fungus. Fungus. Yeah. What an odd message. What a, what an odd message for a trust movie. The trust fungus. the fungus. Yes, that's throughout the whole damn movie. It's even, I think it's on the on DVD too. And actually, here's a good thing for you people in the UK, if you're watching. There is a Blu-ray release coming on the UK, which kind of sucks for it us. Is. It it's is. already it, yeah, it's been out for the past one or two years so far, thanks to Second Sight Films. I have their Blu-ray release of Fly the Navigator, which is Region Zero, but not Super Mario Brothers, which I so badly. I want. I know I know, SMBMovie.com is a great source if you want to get into the movie and all the gloriness of the movie. They post updates whenever they can, and I saw the Blu-ray release and I was like, oh my god, it looks gorgeous! Like they. They lifted out, you know, the Disney DVD, like, they restored it to gloriness, like, it's really good in HD. And yes, Disney has the distribution rights to Super Mario Bros., so the, don't expect the Blu-ray from Disney. Yeah, uh, they... Uh, back to back to their performances, yeah, what we... What I, what I said back in our Bob Hoskins uh, review, or... or what I, 
I, either I said it or somebody else said it was that he was always he was always good at, at giving a hundred and ten percent. I th- I think that was maybe you, Morgan, that said that. And I think uh, <laughs> this movie he really shows that he uh, even though we we keep talking about he hated it, and then I find out I think uh, it was Mike that mentioned this he. Uh, he was wearing a cast during part of the production. Yes. <laughs> let, let, yeah, let me explain that a bit, because there's a scene where his hand gets slammed into the, the cop car, and throughout the rest of the movie, they had a cast of, you know, because he barely slammed it so hard he needed his cast, and they painted it pink to match his skin tone. So you couldn't tell that his hand was in a cast, because it was so rarely seen on the shots, and it's just... And it, and it told James, I was like, really? I, I didn't notice. It's actually a pretty good trick, though. It is. It was a very good trick to, you know, to uh, do that. Yeah. The, uh, but there's, like, uh, there's a lot of things going for it. The special effects in it at the time were really good. You have a actual animatronic of Yoshi. That was pretty good. I love Yoshi. <laughs> Yoshi, which is so cute. It, Yoshi, well, he. Here's the here's the big advantage with that. He, um, and you look at this thing and you, you're just wondering, okay, where's where are the strings at? You you can't. It it looks like an actual creature. It yes. It moves independently. Yes. It, it's amazing, and he actually uses his tongue in the movie. Yes. You, so that's just, it's one thing it it's one thing to disappoint your audience and not have a have him be able to ride Yoshi like he does in the games, but mm-hmm. at, well, he was at least he's still raptor, but then he'd be creepier. Yeah, we yeah, that... a little bit bigger. Well he's supposed to be a cute little dinosaur. There's dinosaurs everywhere. Yeah, I mean if they if they had if they had tried to strictly develop the game into a, in a film, what, what would they have? Giant cartoonish Goombas walking around in a live-action universe? Well, it's funny because the original scripts they had before they went with this version would have been, like, really close to the video game. It would have been, like, really straightforward up fantasy. They'd be going into these different worlds with the actual dragon, Bowser, and stuff like that. And I guess they settled for this one under budget, cost, and because the technology was as far as they could go with the animatronics and stuff. But they really tried. They, they really tried. I still would have loved to see what it would have been like if they actually went all out and made those platforms and stuff like that, have Toad be the little mushroom character and stuff like that. But they tried. They did. They, they yeah. made an effort, and people are just... They don't... <sighs> I remember, I remember when I was reviewing this with Megan, um, on my show, she was like trying to hold back, like literally she was like a big Mario fan. She was sitting there going, <laughs> "This is true." Throughout the whole film, she was like ready to break down and go psychotic, um, but she there are points where she was like, "Yeah." yeah, yeah. I found some good things, but my feelings store me in the same. This is a bad adaptation. God forbid, I I remember I teased her by having the garbage build kids on my DVD shelf with the novelty wall off, and I sold it. Um, to me, Super Mario Brothers is just like a huge guilty pleasure. Yeah, it's not a perfect film, but you know what? They really did what they could. It's not the best. It's not, you know, it's as far as they could come with that one. When you really think about it, video game adaptations today are not really hitting their stride very well because they have that double-edged sword of going with the source or doing something different. And in the 90s, they were doing the polar opposite. They were saying, let's take all these elements and see if we can expand with them because we can't create, like... I'm trying to think of an example. Um, Mortal Kombat. It'd be so difficult to do all that violence and stuff because this is the most violent game out there. Kids are playing it. We need to, you know, get their attention with something like that. Um, this would get us like an R and NC-17, so we got to scale back. 
to them, the studio was about making it commercially acceptable as they could. And that's where Super Mario Brothers, the movie, falls in the sort of pit. They literally looked at it and said, okay, how can we make this movie feasible for all audiences? Um, okay, we'll have dinosaurs, because everyone loves dinosaurs. We'll have uh, certain actors here and there, because they're sort of bankable, even though we had other options, which could have been interesting in some aspect. Like Danny DeVito doing Mario and directing the movie at the same time. <laughs> Which, this is true, he was offered to do it. He was offered to direct and also star as Mario, which would have been weird, but then again, maybe his twisted close-ups would have been mm-hmm. too much. Well, he's short enough, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, Mario's short. I mean, yeah. You get someone tall to play Luigi. I mean, you got the perfect casting, but... I, I, I can't Why don't you just hire me, you know? <laughs> no, no, you gotta say it right. Why don't you just hire me, you know? Uh, oh, no, no, no. What if it's another team up with Arnold Schwarzenegger? They well, were going to have him as King Koopa. I was going to say, yeah, he was offered for King Koopa, but turned it down. Um, you <laughs> Yeah, you could you imagine without... Thing. I'm taking your princess. <laughs> yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger is King Koopa without Dennis Hopper. You could, could you imagine? You know what I like about the mud? It's clean and it's dirty. I'll be back on the ninth level. <laughs> they they were they even approached Michael Keaton to yep. play King Koopa. Yeah, I'll be passing the role. Um, oh, Tom, uh, Tom Hanks. Tom yeah. Hanks was considered for Mario. Oh, but and actually, here's a connection was, between. Oh. Here's a connection between a Water World and this one. Kevin Costner was offered the role to play King Koopa too. Uh, I, 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 I can't see him being. No, there. I can't. I can't. No. no, it's weird. Uh, Harold Ra- Harold Ramis was offered to direct the film too at one point. Declined. Dennis. That would, uh, that would have been so interesting. That would have been like maybe a big Ghostbusters take. Like have Mario and Luigi have these backpacks on their back, and instead of blowing stuff up, it's just a bunch of sh- suction cups. Oh yeah. We did that. It's called Luigi's Mansion. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was about to say Mario's Sunshine, but close enough. Um, Dennis Hopper was expressed interest in the role of Mario because his fans were fans of the game. Dustin Hoffman oh. as Mario. <gasps> Dustin Hoffman? Yeah, Dustin Hoffman as Mario. No. Hey, it's a me, Mario. Look at me, I jump and break stuff and things. Yeah, Tom Hanks was. Um, wa- Tom Hanks wanted the role, but Nintendo worried that the star of. Turner Hooch and Joe vs. the Volcano couldn't headline a blockbuster. Um, uh, boy, were they wrong. But you know what? I'm glad that he wasn't in the role. Yeah, that's why we had him in Philadelphia. That's why we had him in Philadelphia. I heard it's a good movie. I've seen yeah. clips. So, Don't it, judge me. It's it's okay. It's one of his one of his good works. the The cool thing about this film is that they had the balls. They had the balls to build Dino Hatton, which was the whole place where the second universe is, was built on an abandoned cement factory in the woods outside of Williamton, North Carolina. The sets were adapted into the existing structure of the building, which I was like, dude. He took all the balls to build all this, and it's just... Ah, the set design. Set design. The backgrounds are just beautiful. I mean, especially in HD and the Blu-ray in the UK, but the the, the high prerogative. I'm surprised Mm -hmm. no one has brought up one of my favorite scenes in the movie, which clearly states this movie's fun factor. Hmm. Which one was it? Prison escape by mattress surfing in frozen pipe. Yes, so I fucking love that scene. That, that the was music fun. make it the music yes. makes it work so well. Yes. The soundtrack the soundtrack is actually a good note too, because James honestly knows he's like, What is it? what is this song? I wanna know what the song is, so I looked it up and I was like, There you go, it's a it's a guitarist doing it's a guitar solo kind of instrumental piece it's pretty what was cool. it called again oh, what the fuck was it I'm trying to remember 
Um, actually, let me go. I'm trying to remember, because the soundtrack is actually a good one. Well, the theme, almost unreal by Roxette. Morgan has some familiarity with that song. Goomba, Goomba, Waka Waka, Goomba, Goom, Goom, Waka Waka, Goomba. And yeah, Walk the Dinosaur cover, which I didn't kind of like George Clinton. It's, I can't, yeah. Speed it's, of Light. That's what it was, Speed, speed of, of Light. Thank you, Speed of yeah, Light. Yeah, Speed of Light, because I couldn't think of it for the longest time. It's, it, yeah, it's, it's by a well known guitarist who does, he did other soundtracks too. I mean, the soundtrack alone was pretty good. I mean, like I said, Almost Unreal by Roxette was, uh, Originally intended for Hocus Pocus, but it pissed the duo so bad. It was like, oh, why'd you choose to shoot my bro? Yeah, you fool. But, yeah, that scene alone with the mattresses, oh my god, that's amazing. <laughs> that was and amazing. Then, and, then, and then you have, like, the Goomba soldiers surfing after them. Yep, yep, and you get the Goombas and the Koopas going. Because the, Goom, the Goom, Goomba and the Koopa designs, I mean, the Koopa designs are just the, the lizard head, but the Goombas are just like those... Big tall bodies with a small head, and it was just like, that's your interpretation of a Goomba. I, I still say they should have been called Koopa Troopas, because they do have that turtle aspect because of their small heads and big bodies. That's that, that's what they should have been called. I mean, of course you do have Toad in the film too. He, he's he's like the uh, the radical. He's a piece. he's a he's a peace neck hippie guy that uh, that gets dumbed down. Yeah, he gets he turns into be a Goomba. With, oh, yeah, a, with a, a harmonica Peter Nixon. Yeah. It's, this film is just... Oh, you son of a bitch. You do have the soundtrack, all right. <laughs> Bonus points. I swear, I love the soundtrack. I could listen to the soundtrack of this film so many times. This has Almost Unreal by Roxette, Loves the Drug by Divinals, Walk the Dinosaur by the Goombas, I Would Stop the World by Charles and Eddie, I Want You by Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch, symbolism. Uh, Where Are You Going by Extreme, Speed of Light by Joe Strandy. Yeah. Uh, Str Strandy. Citriani. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Breakpoint by Megadeth, Tire Mother Down by Queen, and Cantaloupe by US3. Yeah. It's, it's... Flip Fantasia, that's in there? I didn't catch it. Cantaloupe. Cantaloupe's on this one. Fit, fit, fit Fantasia. Da, 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 yeah. Da, 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 yeah. That's in the movie? I didn't notice that. No, me either. <coughs> it's, it's, it's one of those films, like, you, this is where Dennis Hopper's, like, at his prime. Like, he's, he, when villain roles were getting, I mean, he did speed at, during the 90s, and this is, like, his most, like, you love him for it. It's, like, you kind of, like, enjoy his acting a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, he's got that... Uh, he's got that Max Headroom hair going on, too. Yes, and that's probably what the director said. Hey, uh, hey Hopper, uh, wait, uh, you should have the hair like uh, mid head wreck Max Room, you know, our character we did. You know, he looks pretty cool on you. So, as you discover, we talked about the 90s villain roles of Dennis Hopper. There's, there's tons and tons more. He's been in the business since the 60s. There's plenty of films for you to check out. I mean, we only presented three of them. Live in peace, Dennis Hopper. You've been a great actor, director. Enjoy all the Paps Blue Ribbon, man. <sighs> Enjoy the mud. It's clean and dirty at the same time. I just... It's been five years. It's been five years since he's died. I just can't believe that. It's its just... Time has flown by since he died. Yeah. I mean... There's some actors that I kind of just... Don't... <sighs> don't care for it, but Dennis Hopper, you know, I, I kind of follow his career in there, and, you know, I loved Speed, I loved Super Mario Bros., I loved Waterworld, and, you know, he would have been, he would have gone on to do much more stuff. You know, he was, he was really good. Really good. 
His acting is top notch. When it comes to directing, it was really good. And and you know we would have heard about you know Texas Chainsaw Massacre two from Jada if she was here, and we would we would have heard his one one of his last roles in uh, Alpha and Omega from I Matt. Am, I am the Lord of the Harvest. Bring it down. So, I guess you know if you're watching us. We didn't miss too much with Alpha and Omega, so... No. Yeah, we didn't miss too much with Swing Vote, either, or is the politician. That was pretty much, like, the human version of King Koopa, but not as funny. No. We would have talked about Speed, but we kind of mentioned that briefly in the in previous episode. I mean, he just... Oh, pop quiz, hot shot. I mean, honestly, have, have, you, you guys have seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre too, right? Yep. Okay. He was great at that. He, he was so insane. The only thing that... it was missing. The only thing it was missing. Joe Bob Briggs. Safu. <laughs> I felt bad when they cut that scene out. I remember I, I even I, when I wrote that letter to uh, John Bloom, aka Joe Bob Briggs. He was like, Dear Morgan, thanks for following my miserable filmography. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, man. So, yes, if you're watching this, just go go check out Dennis Hopper. He's a great actor. Check out Waterworld. Check out Super Mario Bros. Just, in top of the world, if you can find a copy, I mean, if you can catch it while it's on Netflix, go ahead. And two quickies, Why not, you know? And, and, and two quickies, Blue Velvet, if you really want to see him, go all out, balls to the wall, insane. Like, like literally, he's just slapping Isabel Harper. He's, again, intimidating Kyle McLaughlin. This is a great scene where they're outside, and he asks what kind of beer he's like. Kyle McLaughlin mumbles something, he goes, Heineken, fuck that shit, Babs Blue Ribbon! <laughs> There's even a great scene where he serenades to uh, Kitty Colored Clown, I think the song is called. I, I forgot the other name. Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, that's another great one. He's supposed to be a hero and he's just running around with a chainsaw, cutting things down. Yeah. Yes, Hopper. We'll miss ya. Mm -hmm. um, next time. Next time. Which I'm gonna do a shoestring connection here. I told Morgan about this earlier, but and there's certainly there... no way I can ruin this because there truly is no way I can reference it without even saying it, except for the fact of acting out in some strange, bizarre way, which I really don't see that kind of happening in this kind of day and light. So Dennis Hopper. Well, you have to put a little bit more pausing in certain spots. Yes. Well. I kind of would like to do the pause, but then again, it'd just be kind of awkward because you don't know if I'm actually saying something or waiting for a taxi cab or my constipation to pass through. No. You know, you know, what? kind of the inflection, what? you know what I mean. I mean, I can't really fucking do it. Fuck. And, and you have to, you have to sort of pretend like you're, you're keeping a cold, a cold metal object jammed up your ass during the performance. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm having a hard time reading the script on my touch screen. <laughs> so, I'm trying to coincide this here. The reason why I'm going with the next episode is because Dennis Hopper was in another great film called True Romance. Um, Directed by Tony Scott, uh, written by Quentin Tarantino, starring uh, Christian Slater, Patricia, Patricia Arquette, Val Kilmer, Gary Oldman, Brad Pitt, and of course, Christopher Walken and Dennis Hopper. So, Dennis Hopper and Christopher Walken has seen the film, and that's why I'm kind of going with Christopher Walken as the next episode. We'll kind of be exploring uh, Christopher Walken films, you know. You know, he was originally gonna be on Solo in Star Wars. And when you think about it, 
that would have been disastrous. Uh, that would have been disastrous for uh, Harrison Ford in particular. Hey, look at me. I like got a blaster and a walking carpet for a friend. Isn't that kind of interesting, isn't it? Whatever you say, fuzzball. Now, if you excuse me, I'm gonna go fire Greedo first because I deserve the shoot first. And if he shoots first, then it's gonna cause a lot of anger in the fandom or something. I don't know, it's like the force is in my bloodstream or something. <laughs> so, yes, uh, comment below. What is your favorite Dennis Hopper film, and what film are you? Do, what film do you think we're going to talk about for Christopher Walken for the last week of May, May thirty first? Uh, make sure you like this video. Subscribe for more Cinema Royale episodes. I noticed you guys are subscribed to me. Keep it up. I, I'm, I think I'm really close to four hundred, but I want to go to five hundred because uh, maybe I'll do a special video with some five hundred subscribers. Um. Yeah, if you, uh, I got other stuff on the channel, I got this podcast, which there's, uh, well, the, the, the 53 episodes, you can check out the archives, there's a lot of topics we talk about. I have a, another podcast that I did back in the day, my first podcast, check that out, I did an interview with Jimmy Screamer Claus, who did the film, with the Dad Go to Die, and he's got a new film coming out soon, whenever, uh, called When Blackbirds Fly. Check that out. There's a lot of things to check out. Go subscribe to my channel, damn it. Just go subscribe. I'm rambling because I'm thinking about what to say next. I, uh, spot ah, too much sugar. I shouldn't, uh, shouldn't have drink soda and had my waffles. <laughs> I'm so torturing you guys with the step for wives. You better not, you son of a gun. I am He's not. Cri Christopher Walken's in the movie. Maybe, but yeah. ten buck. Ten buck says uh, says Matt chooses ants. <laughs> With that, this is probably gonna be a, a long podcast because I didn't. I don't have a timer. I didn't start the timer, so that's why you didn't hear it. I didn't start the timer, so. I, I just went on a whim and started without using the timer, so there's some timer, so it's probably a two-hour podcast, like the old podcast, so which is good. It might be All a two-parter. Right. Who knows? I, I don't freaking know anymore. I mean, just, it's been Cinema Royale. See it in two weeks. Adios, amigos. Play us out, Joe. <laughs> God, what have I done? You made a masterpiece is what you did. Masterpiece. Let's fuck. I'll fuck anything that fucking moves. <laughs> I bet. I bet, Morgan. Titties and titties and Titanic. I don't like them. That's why I go gay. And in the unrated version, we get Diddy. <laughs> I, I, I was I was gonna make a joke about how Matt was gonna see a stripper named Debbie.
For real? <laughs> I was thinking about that because, like, hey, you're at a bachelor party. There's gotta be strippers. <laughs> I tell you, he 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 avoided the number one rule. He went for a hoe instead of the bro. <laughs>